Sometimes, despite your best efforts, your recovery gets derailed. Powerful life triggers, a lack of support, a wrong turn. Relapse happens, it's frustrating, but the important thing is to not wait another day to get back on track. Foundations Recovery Network is here to help with more than a dozen outpatient programs and six residential treatment centers to choose from. Our co-occurring treatment model gets to the root of your addiction, putting you back on the road to recovery. Call 877-714-1318 to reach our confidential helpline 24-7. We're waiting by the phone. That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. What's up? Thanks for tuning in today. Thanks to Humans for bringing us in, and thanks to you for supporting the show. Today's guest is Anthony Alvarado from We All Rise Together and WeAllRiseTogether.org. Super stoked to have him on the show today, doing some awesome things, some amazing work, and we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Anthony's struggle with addiction as well. I want to give some love to everybody out there in the Bay Area and up in Sacramento, really throughout the great state of California. It's an honor to represent uh, the recovery movement, and I'm um, so proud to be a part of it, so thank you. Um, First and foremost, I want to tell you real quick about a new treatment option. DXRX provides access to alcohol treatment specialists with safe medication and ongoing monitoring for people who want to stop or reduce their drinking, all through a simple phone app. So at the first appointment, before you start the program, you'll meet with a physician who's a specialist in addiction. You'll discuss your goals, your drinking, your health history, any concerns you might have. And then the physician will create a personalized care plan for you. You then monitor your progress with a breathalyzer and the DXRX mobile app. And the physician will also recommend safe, effective, non-habit forming medicine that can ease alcohol cravings. So the DXRX team is a great group of doctors and professionals right here in the Northern California Bay Area. Jess and I met with them personally to discuss the DXRX program. Um, they're really out to take substance abuse treatment to the next level. So be sure to check them out. Go to that soberguide.com and you'll see the DXRX logo, Stronger Than Alcohol. Click on the logo to get started today. Also want to give a little love to Foundations Recovery Network. Thanks again for supporting the show and some love to Sober Nation and soberpodcast.com. So our guest today, Anthony Alvarado, he's a long uh, he's been in long-term recovery. He's got a desire to change the conversation around addiction, that's for sure. And, and we're gonna get into um, a, a bunch of the amazing work that him and his team are doing. Um, he's the co-founder of Rise Together, and they're a dedicated organization whose mission is to be the face of recovery through advocating, educating, and bringing a voice to the voiceless. Anthony's hope and vision is to create a community where the youth are heard, man, which is so huge. They're loved and inspired to live in hope, man. I love it. Anthony has also founded Rise and Grind Recovery Radio, where he looks to invite conversation from all over the nation to help illustrate that recovery is amazing. He's had some phenomenal guests on there, and I'm sure we'll get into that uh, in just a bit. Anthony, great to have you on the show today, my friend. What's up, man? How are you? <laughs> What's up? What's up? I just want to thank you right away just for connecting with me and inviting me on the show. I mean, truly, I you know looked out uh, when I started Rising Grind Recovery Radio and started to look at uh, other podcasts that might have some similarity and you know, I found yours and I was even listening to it this morning and, you know, I use it for some uh, weekly motivation. So, you oh, know, you're awesome. doing phenomenal things too, man. So I just want to thank you right away. Uh, outside of just being on this interview, I think you're doing some really great work and providing some excellent resources. And it's even helped me, you know, uh, tune in and, and really think about recovery and, and even give that information out to our audience as well. So thank you, man. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. I love it, man, because it kind of such a great point too. at the root of it. You know, we're in our own recovery just as individuals. So, you know, we're doing work. And at the same time, we got to focus on ourselves and still remember to keep those tools, um, you know, a whole bunch of different ones out there to use. And uh, I just appreciate that, man. Thank you. Um, yeah, one of the things I love, man. So let's kind of let's kind of start here. It says, man, that you've traveled over 100,000 miles with your team, bro. That is a lot of traveling, man. So what's up with yeah. that? 
Yeah, man, a lot of a lot of traveling, a lot of coffee, a lot of <laughs> a lot of filling up at the gas station, and you know, really, that's actually been in a really short time. You know, we're talking over a hundred thousand miles, give or take, um, over the last three years. You know, we mm. got started back in September of 2013, and like we've discussed before, I know we got a chance to connect to you just personally, and I also want to thank you for that, man. I, I was really blown away by the conversation and just your authenticity. And we were able to share some things, which I'm sure we'll get into, you know, just about some of the struggles we've had uh, with our father and, and, and just with our family and, mm. and talking about our recovery. But, man, that's what it's all about, right? I think I think the travel, regardless of how much it has been or how much it might be, um, along the way, I have met uh, absolutely amazing and, and phenomenal people, whether that's right here in the state of Wisconsin, throughout the Midwest, or even across the nation. I mean, even over the last like eight months, I've flown out of state 10 times to places like Boston and New Hampshire and Vermont and, and Denver and, and Las Vegas and, wow. you know, look to go out to the West Coast. And really, for me, I, I really see myself and myself as, and the team, we agree that we're more, we are educating our communities by sharing our story. You know what I mean? And and we're also doing some really awesome uh, research along the way. And, and with that research, we've been able to educate all different types of people uh, across the nation, whether that's via online or even in professional settings at conferences or, or rallies or coalition meetings. And I think education is absolutely key. And I know we'll get more into like what I'm doing with Rise Together. But I mean, that's that's where we started is it's just advocating and saying, you know what? I have a voice yeah, and my yeah. story matters. And I am just so humbled and grateful that that the people that have connected with me believe in not only my story, but our team. And we've been invited uh, to so many different places. And that's really why we've been traveling as much as we have. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, and, and in that travel, uh, in the, all those stops, different events and speaking engagements, um, you, you've spoken over 400 times and I love this number, man. This, this is just, this is awesome right here, bro. Educated over 120,000 youth on addiction and mental health. Tell me, tell me about that, man. Like what, it, what does that feel like, dude? Because that's just, it's amazing. Yeah. I think, um, when I started it, it me and Doug, uh, the other co-founder rise together and even Nadine, our program manager, we never thought it would turn into what it is today, right? Yeah. Like we we knew that there was um, this reality that you know there was a point in our lives that maybe we almost lost our lives to our own addiction, and we still you know are battled with that disease on a daily basis. But we also started to connect with other people that could say the same thing, and so when when we got invited to a local rally in Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, you know what, man, I didn't. I didn't want to go on stage, you know, because I, <laughs> I didn't know really what to say. I didn't know what I was really doing up there. I never spoke before, you know, in front of a crowd. And even it, even if it was a small crowd, I was just so nervous about it, you know. Yeah. Um, but I got up there. I was encouraged uh, by my best friend Douglas Darby to do it. And I, I can't remember exactly what I said, but what was important is what when I got off the stage, somebody came up to me and just thanked me for being open and being honest and being vulnerable and saying, you know what, you motivated me to want to, uh, you know, really dive into my recovery, to want more out of life. And then uh, at that moment, I've embraced like uh, a switch flipped, if you will. And I realized, you know what, it wasn't about me. You know what I mean? It, it yeah, was about... Yeah. It was about them. It was about the voiceless. It was about the ones that are struggling, the ones that might be hopeless. And I remember what that felt like to be all alone and, and feel like nothing was going to change and, and really starting to feel like I was I was going to give up in life on all things, whether it was my children or my faith or, or myself as an individual. Yeah. Um, and I, deep down in my heart, I don't want uh, people to be... I don't want people to be struggling with that um, to the point where they lose their life. And unfortunately, we live in a world today where we are losing uh, over 400 plus people per day every single day in America due to drugs and alcohol. It is an epidemic that is spreading across the nation. Every community, there's no discrimination hitting every 
uh, part of a community. It, you know, it's not even so much an issue of a, of a big city, but it's every city and it's every yeah. family. One out of three families in America are faced um, or impacted by addiction. You know, there is uh, research that says every four minutes, every four minutes, somebody is dying from drugs and alcohol or, or a parent is losing a child to this addiction epidemic. Yep. I mean, think about that, man. I mean, think about the tragedy that that, that holds, right? But how often do you really hear about it, man? How often do you really see it in mass media? How often do you see it even on social media? And I'm not saying that there isn't any momentum out there. Yeah. But when yeah. we got started, man, I felt like everybody was silent and nobody wanted to talk about it. So guess what, man? We started to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah, that's that's nice right there. And that's uh, I think that's really where it starts is just opening that line of communication and then, uh, you know, the, the education uh, behind it and the awareness. I mean, it all kind of ties in, ties in together. And I want to talk more about We All Rise Together and uh, some of the work specific. But let's let's back up a minute and uh, and get to know you a little bit. Um, we kind of already alluded to it. You know, I have some similarities in our own story. And, and um, you know, we, we talked a while back. Uh, we had a great conversation, by the way, and I, I appreciate that as well. Um, I, I remember actually after we got off the phone that, 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 um, that afternoon, um, I just had just a really just good feeling, man. And, and I bring that up, too, because you're a cool cat and I enjoyed the convo. But not yeah. only that, as an example of when we talk and when we're open about the things that we're struggling with and when we can find a little piece of vulnerability within us and be okay with sharing that, um, there's something very powerful about that. And there's something, um, there's something that is very healing about that too. And, and that's really what this, this whole recovery movement is about, man, is, is opening up and talking about things and, and starting to communicate together and come together collectively. Um, so back to you, what, um, take us back. Like you have your own struggle with addiction. Um, you know, you, you have, uh, I know you have a couple of kids. I know you have a family. Um, take us back, man. Like what's, what's some, what's, where does your story kind of start? You know, in all reality, um, it starts way before uh, the active use ever started. You know, if I think back, if I really look back, uh, what has happened uh, since I've been born, you know, there was, there was moments early in elementary school, uh, middle school where I didn't, I didn't feel like I was good enough. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I didn't feel like, uh, I was, I was meeting, meeting the expectations and the standards that were being placed on me. Um, of course then I, maybe I couldn't have explained it too well, but I, I always felt like I had to, you know, work towards this perfection that I had to, you know, really, you know, make myself to be out the to be the best. Yeah. And that left this huge impression on my schoolwork, um, on the things that I enjoyed, on my friendships, and it really created this uh, lack of self-esteem. You know what I mean? Yeah. And eventually over time, that's, that self-esteem, that central um, focus point in my life started to carry over and started to increase, um, I think in part, because there were some things that I went through when I was a when I was a young young lad, if you will, <laughs> um, that I I have a hard time talking about today. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, my parents you know struggle with the disease of addiction, and I remember in third grade, you know, the fights and, and the yelling and the things that happened in our home, the abuse that was going on, and the destruction or the the horrible lifestyle that my parents were living. And don't get me wrong. I love, love, love my parents. Yeah. And I've got a chance to see them both in and out of recovery. I've had a chance to spend some unbelievable moments with them, even recently. And although we, uh, each of us, all have our struggles, you know what? If if they would have received the support and if they would have been encouraged to, you know, be vulnerable and ask for help at different points in their life, there's a there's a strong likelihood that you know, our family wouldn't have went through the hardships that we faced. Yeah. So now you have this kid that is, um, you know, trying to prove himself, growing up, feeling like he wasn't good enough. Then he sees his family falling apart. 
you know, my parents got divorced and it kind of started to go downhill right around 13, 14 years old. You know, I was that kid that said, I will never, ever use drugs and alcohol because I was so <laughs> upset, so upset about what, what I saw my parents go through and the lifestyle that they were living. But by the, four, by the age of 14, I started to, you know, drink alcohol and eventually I started to smoke weed and, you know, from there it was just like, yes, whatever you have in front of me, yes. Because it, it brought things into my life that I thought were comforting. Like I didn't have to deal with that stress and that anxiety and that depression or so I think. It just like, it covered it up. It helped me to cope with the bullshit that was going on in my life. It helped me to escape like that reality for a moment and, and feel like everything was okay. Yeah. Because yeah. ultimately, that's that's what I wanted to feel. I wanted to feel good enough. I wanted to feel okay. And when you're trying to go to people that you trust, like your parents, and they're not there because they're messed up in their addiction, where do you turn? You turn to your friends. And I had some unbelievable friends, and I still do today. And I stay in touch with the ones that you know I partied with back in the day. And, and life is drastically different for all of us. But whether you talk about experimentation or just having a good time, for me, that good time turned into my worst nightmare. And by the age of 24 years old, I almost lost my life. I mean, addiction really just gripped me and broke me down and brought me to my knees and threw my face into the arena, face down, in the situation where I lost everything that was important to me. Hmm. Everything. There was no more... There was no more parties. There was no more good times. There was no more good feelings. I felt like I had no friends. It broke me down spiritually and mentally and emotionally. I lost my job. I lost some freedoms. I got in trouble. I mean, you could say my story sounds very, very similar to others. And that's the thing, man. Yeah. yeah. There's a yeah. lot of us that grew up the same way. Hard times, rough times, we all go through struggle. My struggle almost got the best of me, and I am grateful that I can sit here today and say I'm a person in long-term recovery. And what that really means to me, like what that absolutely means to me is like, first of all, I'm a person, right? Like, yes, I struggle with the disease of addiction. Yes, I have a mental illness. I struggle with anxiety and depression. Even to this day, even before this call, I was a nervous wreck, and I've spoke many, many, many times. But it lets me know that I'm real and authentic and that I'm actually... You know, I, I'm learning, I'm growing and that's okay. That's okay that I'm not perfect. That's okay that I don't live in this world of being the best. You know what, man, I'm being me and that's yeah. good enough, you know? And finally at 32 years old, going on 33 in March, I can finally say, I know who Anthony Alv Alvarado is. I know who I am. And it took many, many steps to get here. I mean, I think. Today, I can say, yes, I have been completely clean and sober for the past four years from all drugs and all alcohol or forms of alcohol. And that's amazing. Yeah. That's absolutely yeah. being complete sobriety. But you know what, man? I found sobriety eight years ago. So I have fallen in the past, but every single time I learned something new about myself. Every single time I learned about the importance of putting the right people around you, to getting the right support. The right not only support group but mentorship and helping to develop my life and personally grow in all avenues of my life whether that's spiritually or working on myself as an individual helping to overcome those challenges with stress and anxiety and self-esteem focusing on being a dad and ultimately man i wrote it down this morning you know what we don't have it figured out nobody does but if I consistently show up every day and I act with small attainable goals and I address my weaknesses but focus on my strengths more often, well, then guess what, brother? I'm doing my part. Huh. That's where I'm at today. I'm in long-term recovery, loving life, still facing challenges up and down, still being impacted by addiction, still watching my father struggle, still have felt moments of wanting to give up, whether that's in business or in life. Because you know what? The arena's tough, man. You keep coming back. You keep swinging. But sometimes you get tired. You know, I heard recently, I heard recently this, this quote, and it was in a movie, and it said, you know what? I'm, I've swam 
I swam across the ocean, and I'm only a couple miles away from shore, but I'm barely keeping my head up. And sometimes that's how life feels. But maybe you got to flip over on your back, and you just got to wait it out, you know? Yeah, I think, that's, I think uh, the, the um, sorry, I had a little feedback there. Um, dude, I love that because, and I, and this kind of goes back to a lot of the things that you're talking about too, is that like, I'm, I'm human and I feel. And so even when we feel, you know, some, some of these difficult things that we go through in life, um, I mean, we could go down the list, I'm sure for an hour, but the important thing is that we're feeling them and we're, and we're, we're figuring out by, um, by educating ourselves, by talking to people, tools to deal with that instead of, instead of turning to alcohol or drugs and, you know, to, to numb those things. And you, there's, there's many, many people out there who write hand in hand with alcohol or drugs or without, maybe just on their own. Um, my wife is, is, is an example of that. And she's talked very openly about it on the show about her anxiety and depression. And I love that. See, I think you're a good example of that, of being able to um, still be open about that kind of stuff, but then also go out and speak in front of people, come on podcasts, be very open about your recovery. And you're, you're finding a way to harness that energy that can, be, um, that can really destroy a lot of people and, um, and take it and, and use it in a positive manner instead of letting it destroy you. And I think that's a really, really, um, it's almost like this little, this little secret <laughs> formula. And I'm not sure that, that, that anyone has, you know, pinpointed, uh, or maybe for themselves they do, I guess. So I would ask you, what is that little formula that, that you're really working on that you're, um, that you're trying to perfect and trying to get better at each day to kind of harness those feelings of anxiety of, um, you know, like, like you said, of depression, of, of speaking publicly in front of people, and then also just being open about your recovery. Is there a specific thing that is kind of helping you move along through that? Yeah, man, it's always constantly changing, just like our recovery. You know what I mean? It's a process. I mean, I, I'm sitting here in front of a bunch of magazines and a bunch of tools and tips and guides that I, that I started to put into my life. And I, I'm looking right, right now at the magazine, um, that has a feature article with Tim Ferriss. And if you're not familiar with Tim Ferriss, mm -hmm. he has an awesome Tim Ferriss podcast. And the opening statement of this article in Entrepreneur Magazine uh, says, if you can't be happy with what you have, then you can never be happy. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So you talk, you talk about self-improvement. And there's this ideology, I think, that is like, well, I want to personally grow. I think for me, it's it's. I want to personally grow. I always want to continue to have this this thought process in the senses of discovering more mm -hmm. of who I am. So if I if I work off of that framework, if I know like deep down in my heart today at, at almost thirty three years old, I can say I have a reason, I have a purpose. Well, then I can work off of those those uh, foundations of faith. Because for me, man, some things aren't so logical all the time. It's not always going to make sense. But if I believe I have a reason to wake up every single day and that I'm contributing in a positive way, whether that's here at home or I'm taking care of myself and practicing things like starting to read, starting to connect with people that can enrich my life, starting to build positive relationships more often than not, Starting to spend my time with things that are helping me to grow or learn or to aspire after my dreams and goals and aspirations more than I even have today. I mean, look at it this way, man. One of my goals is to be a really great dad. Now, I come from a home that might have been a little tragic. I mean, honestly, as much as it hurts me to say it, you know, my mom gave me my first line of cocaine at like 16 years old. And my dad shot me up for the first time. And instead of coming to my football games or my basketball games, they were teaching me how to fold bindles and huh. sell drugs and smoke crack. And I mean, your parents might hold a bottle to your face when you're a baby, but you don't expect your parents to ever hold a crack pipe to your mouth when you're an adult. That's crazy. And that was, and that was me. And I don't put them out there to say that they were horrible people because you know what? They're, they were sick people. They needed help. And eventually, I needed help too. So I can never say anything bad about them. That's just how we grew up. 
So when I look back at those things, one, I'm grateful that I'm alive, that I didn't give up. And I'm starting to realize that as difficult as it is to struggle with like stress and anxiety and depression, there's some simple things that I can practice like drinking enough water, not drinking too much caffeine, getting enough sleep. I just started meditating on Headspace, which I'm three days in, but I can already tell that it's starting to relax my overall a daily view or perspective on life. Yeah, yeah. I start to pre-plan and schedule out and look ahead and look at the things that work. I write everything down in my calendar. So when I chime in on Sunday night, I can look forward and say, these are the things that I absolutely have to get done. Priorities. And me and you talked about that. Like, look, I have these five things that I have to get done this week. And if I get three out of the five done, then I'm all right. At least I worked on those important things. You know, and then outside of that, you know, taking a look at modeling behavior of people that you trust and you can relate to. You know what? I go to support groups when I need to. I, I reach out to a mentor. I reach out to my pastor. I have people in my life that put me in check and call me out on my bullshit, which is really good for me. And I also start to look at things that are becoming a little bit um, obsessive in my life. I have an addictive personality. Mm -hmm. I love the work, man. If I could do this every single day, all day, every hour, I probably would. But then I have to remember that I have a priority set in my life. I have God, I have my recovery, I have my children, and I have my family. Job comes last, man. So I, it might not be all in priority every single day, but I work hard towards that. And you know what? I'm also doing something I love. And I think that makes a difference. I think a lot of the world today, you go to a job that you just don't like, that you're just not happy with. And people are afraid of change. Whether it's afraid of change to get into a new job, to uh, step it up and ask for help, to maybe go to a different support group or put yourself around people that you normally wouldn't hang out with, that can be scary, man. Yeah. But I, like I said in the beginning, I show up every day and I do those things. You know, I looked back at 2016 and I started to be like, well, what happened? What were the ups? What were the downs? What do I want to do differently this year? And one of the things that stuck out to me is that I really focused on building relationships, building positive relationships. If you, if you look at what models your life, it typically is the people that you hang out with and the things that you read. Those will guide you, you know, over those struggles, to get you through those struggles more often than not. And it also helps you to understand that you're not alone. You're not the only one dealing with the same things that you're dealing with. I'm sure I could talk to somebody right now that almost went through the same exact thing that I went through. And that's why that human connection is so important. I don't have to have a million friends. I might know a lot of people, but if I have five, five, five people in my life that I can count on that would take a bullet for me, well, then I might be all right. You know what I'm saying? And some of those people in my life I do have today. And that is important for me. When you talk about like me growing up, I, I, you know, I wanted to be perfect or I, I deal with self-esteem issues even to this day. But think about what lifts you up. Love, compassion, connection to the community, having a purpose, serving others. That empowers you. And that's what I do in my life. And that's what I do in my job. What, um, what... One of the questions I get a lot, I'm sure you probably hear this a lot too, is how do I know if I have a problem? How do I know if I have an issue? Um, I think that's really ultimately for, for one to decide. It's kind of hard to, I mean, unless there's, unless the circumstances are completely obvious, sometimes they're a little more hidden, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, what was it for you that was finally like that moment that kind of pushed you, pushed you over the edge um, to, to actually seek help, I guess? I think it was a lot of different things. I think um, the moment that like defining moments of like something has to change uh, came in the breath of, of love and compassion that my son shared for me. Hmm. Both my children, to be honest with you. You have two. Yeah, you have two kids. Yeah. You know, uh, Jada, my daughter, she's 11 and, and Gavin, he's 13 years old. And I love those kids more than anything. Sure. Man. And I know they've been a huge motivator for me. And I know even today, like sometimes I don't completely understand, you know, what I do for work or why 
I'm doing what I'm doing and speaking openly, you know, about addiction and some pretty horrible things that happened in my life. But it's it's not even really about that. It's 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 more or less focusing on like the accomplishment of overcoming that struggle. Yeah. But first, I had to be aware of that struggle. And sometimes you don't see it on your own. Sometimes you don't you don't pay mind, especially when you're blind by your addiction. Yeah. So I know right around 24 years old, you know, my son was six. And there was a moment where I was strung out. I was up for about three days. I was clearly bent out on everything you could possibly consume. Uh, you know, I overdosed uh, recently. Uh, luckily, you know, sustained and was be able be able to live and breathe on, but nothing seemed to be changed. Everything seemed to be gone. I was living on the back of my truck. I just was couch surfing from house to house. You know, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a girl. I didn't have a relationship with my kids, but I did see my son that day. And it was like, I can remember it like it was yesterday. And there I sat on the back porch of my grandmother's house and I was smoking my last cigarette and I was just yeah. looking out like dismay, you know what I mean? And it's like, man, nothing's, nothing's going right. And my son was in like my like peripheral, you know, mm. on the left side. And he walked up to me at, at like that young age, and he put his hands on my face and looked me in my eyes. And there's, you know, these tears started to well up. Oh, man. He just he said, you know, Dan, I love you, but don't die. Oh man, you know, he's like, don't die. I love you. And I brought him close and I hugged him. And I'm bawling and I'm just like shaking and. It was in that moment I, I realized, you know what, I'm doing exactly what my father did to me to him, already a young age, and I promised I would never do that if I ever had a family. And today is the day that I'm going to stand up, I'm going to brush my shoulders off, and I'm going to face these fears, I'm going to find courage some way, somehow, I don't know how, but I'm going to make a change. And I'm going to ask for help because I need it. Not for Gavin, not for my son, not for my daughter. Yeah. But I realized it had to be for me. And I went into treatment. And I got some help. I started to go in sport groups. I started to go to church. I started to surround myself. I took myself out of a situation. I moved, got away from some people. And my life slowly changed. And it took a long, long time to get through some of those uncomfortable feelings in the beginning especially but it was that moment where I was aware of what needed to happen and then I started to execute and I started to take action how how important is that aspect of it and and man thank you for sharing that too by the way I mean that's just a, a heartbreaking story um, with, with, uh, with, with the damn good, uh, you know, I want, don't want to say ending, but a damn good outcome up until today, man. And I just, uh, I admire you, man. And, and thank you for sharing that. That's just, um, it's amazing. And, and it's just really, really cool, man. That we don't hear, we don't, you know, we, we get to hear the stories of, um, of heartbreak so much, man. And it's just so cool to hear, um, some success and that deep, uh, love, I guess, man, especially coming from your boy. I mean, that's got to be a bond that's uh, that's that's unbreakable right there. Um, but back 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 to my question, I guess um, one of, one of the things you said in there that stands out to me is, is that you did it for yourself. You didn't do it for your boy. You didn't do it for your for your daughter, for your wife, for you know, for anything but you. I think that's such an important aspect of this. I just had a, a, a conversation. Um, with with a family friend who's been struggling with addiction for you know probably 15 years, and um, you know she she's recently had her her daughter taken away, um, living on the streets, um, you know wants to get her baby back, obviously loves her baby, but is in no condition to do so, and that's one of the things I was kind of trying to. And, and we all know when we're, when we're talking to, to to people in general, and especially ones that we love, we can't tell them what to do. I'm not gonna. I can't tell anybody what to do. It's got to be up, you know, up to that person to do it. But ultimately, we can't do things for our our family, for our job, because we got in trouble and and be successful at them. So that component to really genuinely wanting to do it for ourselves is so important. 
And man, it's like, how do you find that though? I mean, is it, is it that bottom? Is it that low? Is it that point where you, you feel like you're going to die? Or in your case, your son says, dad, don't die. And then like, boom, you know, something hits you. And it's just like this, it's, it's a spiritual awakening in itself in that moment. Um, what are your thoughts on that man about actually doing it for yourself? Not, not doing it for anything, uh, any other outer circumstances. I think ultimately it has to, it has to be there right? To some extent. Now, I've thought a lot about this and I don't necessarily have a, like a, a super awesome answer. And to be honest you know, with you, but it, for me, I remember the moments and I can, I can just, I can just answer the question off a shared, like a lived experience. Um, I'm sure we share together to some extent is, look, there's been moments in my recovery that I was doing it for somebody else, right? I was doing it for a different reason. Maybe it was to get that job. Maybe it was to get that girl or, or, or maybe, if anything, like get my children back kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that as much as that might be a motivator and that might be something that helps keep me clean and sober today, right? I mean, let's be honest. There's some accountability there, being a father, Absolutely. being a friend, being a significant other, yep. being, you know, a leader in your, in your community, uh, you know, just being a, um, a son, you know, or if somebody's a daughter, like there's, there's those factors. Like I am, I am a person, I am, I have family. And even if the family isn't the best, you still have a family and you can be motivated by that. But how much does that say to believing in yourself? Right? Yeah. So if you have to, um, Put all of your energy and focus and prove yourself to something or in a situation that will eventually end, right? I mean, it could only last for a certain period of time. It's kind of like buying a new car in some senses, like, or a new pair of shoes. You're like, oh man, this is the coolest thing ever. Check out these new shoes. Check out this new car. I feel really awesome. And that goes on maybe for a few weeks, maybe for a couple of months, maybe for a year. But eventually that awesomeness that was in the beginning fades away. And I'm not comparing like buying a new car or buying a new pair of shoes to like making your first step in recovery. But what I am saying is the things that you wear, the things that you drive don't make you, you. So why would you let something on the outside define the person that you are? Just like for me, I don't let addiction define me. I don't let my mental illness define me. Now, don't get me wrong. I do in part let my recovery define me though. Right? That's a good point. But it's not everything about Anthony Alvarado. You know, yes, I struggle with addiction, but I'm not going to define myself as an addict because I'm much more than that. I'm much, much more than that. So when I go into this, I'm asking for help, even at my, at, at where I'm at today, it's because I care about the person I am. And you could go back to like that old statement that everybody's heard probably a million times but really doesn't understand what it means or maybe some do but I, it's worth it has a lot of value and that's like you have to love yourself before you love others yeah. and the only way you're going to be able to love yourself I believe is if you start building a relationship with yourself by understanding who you are the good the bad the ugly the awesome but it takes that unbelievably hard moment especially when you're wrapped up in addiction to face yourself in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, Your I, biggest I, critic, especially that inner critic will destroy you. You are the enemy, right? My in own, some dude, for sure, man. It, it, it is. And, and I've talked about that before. Like I'm my own worst enemy. You know, I'm the one inside of me that will destroy myself more than anybody else can. And I got to say, you know, when I started to face that, it, it was and still continues to be because I'm, I'm on a journey learning stuff new every single day. The most enlightening experience when the fog starts to clear and my brain starts to thaw out a bit and I start to learn, you know, even dealing with some of the hard shit that I don't want to look at and I don't want to address. Um, it, it's, it's the most enlightening experience getting to know yourself. And when like when I started to do that. Then just what you were talking about earlier, I started to find what I was really passionate about. I started to find, I, I felt inside of me that I had this purpose, this purpose to live. And it was just, it's an, it's an amazing thing, man. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it goes to something else I wanted to bring up. Um, whether I'm reading an article right now that kind of states 
states it or I've thought about it in my own life, because I know myself and I know like my addictive personality and I know the things that I struggle with, you know, I, you know, struggle with anger sometimes. I struggle mm-hmm. with just kind of just being down and, and, and I'm generally a positive person, but you know, I have those low moments, but there's also a realization that I'm starting to understand as I get older that self-improvement is awesome, right? Personal development is great. And wanting, like, if I were, if you were to ask me, like, what's your life goal? It wouldn't necessarily be like the most amazing, awesome CEO ever, or like, <laughs> you know, to be the richest person in the room. It, it would be more or less like my life goal is to discover who I am more and more, and have that fine understanding of the people around me and how we're interconnected and how we're really supposed to love and care for our children and our family. Because you know what, you are the moments of success really come into like for me showing up right yep. like yep. not any parent really knows what they're doing exactly but the fact that i'm actually showing up I is have, drastically I different i have no <laughs> idea what i'm doing every day <laughs> right but like i'm showing up and I'm, I'm figuring it out exactly. and sometimes i make mistakes yeah but it because I made a mistake today doesn't need, mean I need to make one tomorrow. And I can take a couple steps back, but I also can run forward. You know, and it's it's going to be up and down. And that's the beauty of life, man. Ups and downs, sadness and joy and laughter. I mean, you're not going to be happy consistently every single day. It's not sunshine and rainbows every time you wake up. Sometimes it just really sucks. Yeah. You know, and some things, sometimes things happen to us that aren't fair and it should never have happened. Well, but it did. Our- our pastor, right. Pastor Dave, um, and you know he he had spoke on this not not too long ago about the difference between happiness and joy. And so happiness is kind of what you're describing. It's not you know it's not going to happen to us all the time. But if we're in a good place in ourselves, we can find joy in the moments that are that are tough. You know that are that are hard to get through. And I know levels of certain things can can be a, a bit more severe than others. So I definitely take that into account when I say that. Um, but point being is when we're when we're true with ourselves and we're honest in ourselves, we can actually look within and we can pull out that genuine uh, joy, even in a situation of adversity, and 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 pull through it too, man. Um, I know, I know we're up against uh, time here. We got a few minutes left. I want to first. I want to just say thank you, man, for your honesty and your openness. You've shared um, quite a few things, man, that has really touched my heart. I'm sure it's touched the hearts of everybody out there listening. And I just want to say first off, thank you for your honesty, man. Yeah, man. And I really appreciate that, you know, to all your audience members out there too. I mean, there's a lot we could talk about and I hope I, you know, can come on the show again. And I was so excited about this interview and there was so much in my head that I wanted to, you know, make sure that we are able to talk about. And, you know, Shane, we can go a little bit over, you know, the yeah. few minutes um, so we can, we can get into it. But to my point before, I just want to leave the audience with, you know, recently I, I faced some really, really difficult times. Yeah, it's really cool to be able to say like the work that we're doing mm-hmm. and I get the chance to travel and meet all these amazing people and I have this huge uh, support network and people on the outside might be like, wow, you know, that guy has it, you know, he has it made. But, you know, I do have a rich life and it's because I'm starting to really focus on the things that are really important in life, like serving others, like building a relationship with my children, like building a relationship with my family, including my parents and finding a great sense of faith and having a purpose. Yes, the rest of the things kind of fall in order in some senses, but there was a moment at the end of this year, actually really the last year and a half, to be honest with you, it's just watching my father struggle with his addiction. And I mean, that's the reason why I started Rise and Grind Recovery Radio outside of what we're doing at Rise Together because, man, with all the resources, all the networking, all the relationships, all the things that I knew, the lived experience, like no matter what, at different moments, I was like, damn it. I, I can't save him. You know what I mean? I can't, I can't control him, but I wanted to. I wanted to put him in a box and put him in a safe place and you know, have him go to treatment for a million years and then get out and live in sober living and then transition to support groups and start focusing on, you know, finding a home and furthering his education and getting back into employment. We have like this, this fantasy, yeah. like, and, and you and I have discussed this because uh, for those out there listening, Anthony and I have talked about this because we share the same thing. And for our listeners, um, I've talked about it on the show before, you know, same, same thing, Anthony, like, 
a lot of what I do is for a couple of homies that passed away and for, um, and, and for, you know, my own struggles with my own family members. And, you know, it's like you, you tried being angry and I tried, you know, being nice and I try and it's like, man, but, but you're right on point. Like I can't, we can't save somebody. It's just not our, it's, it's not our job, you know? Right. And I think the, I think the statement is more, um, on the, on the, on the foundation of we can't control, mm-hmm. right? So we can't, we can Huge. though love. We like, I, I've told my dad recently on the phone, Hey, look, man, I, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent supportive of what you're doing or the actions you're taking. But I know that you're struggling with the disease of addiction. And, and you know what, Dad? All the stuff we've been through, no matter what, today as a man, I can say that I love you mm. and I care about you as a son. And I will be there for you. I won't enable you. I won't encourage or support your drinking or your bad behavior, if you will. Um, and if anything, I have to protect my sobriety and I have to protect my children. So if you want to be in my life, or be around my family, you're going to have to be clean and sober. And if you want that help, my hand has already been out. And I will help you get there. But you have to want it for yourself. And that and that lived experience and sharing what we've been through and how we got through those struggles, man, I know deep down in my heart, even if my dad passed away tomorrow, and we have almost lost his life over the last, twice over the last like eight months, and it's broken me down and it's ripped me down and it helped me. It made me almost feel hopeless Yeah. because I just felt like I just lost control. And I said, how could I, how could I let my dad go through this? And I have all these resources and I'm connected to all these people. And mm-hmm. I, I have my own story recovery and I started to put it on myself. Right. And it's, it isn't my responsibility to live somebody else's life, but it is my responsibility to care about somebody else's life. So I know when I lay down at night, that I did the best that I could, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, and who knows, true. man? Who knows? Maybe this podcast, maybe uh, some moment on stage, maybe a moment that I'm at the local coffee shop, and I run across somebody, and we just happen to connect. I'm able to share that experience with them, and they can relate to that, and they can be inspired by that, and that helps that person. So I know that I've been given this this uh, responsibility to some extent uh, to speak out, and that's and that's part of the reason why I'm on this podcast today. Yeah. I care deeply about the work that we're doing, but it came from that personal lived experience of you know I watched my parents struggle, I almost lost my own life to addiction. I've lost friends and family members as well over the last few years. Between the co-founder and myself alone, we've lost 17 people in the last eight years. That's crazy, man. And I. It contacted every week, it seems like, about somebody that was lost, yeah. somebody that committed suicide, somebody that was um, just deep into their addiction and lost their life to an overdose, that has ruined their entire family, that has ripped themselves apart, that is locked away for life. And that that's the thing, man, is when we start waking up as a country and saying we have to love these people. We have to find compassion. But the one of the ways that we're going to do that, man, is through these stories, yeah, through sharing true. your experience, because mm-hmm. then people can relate to it. Then people can care about it. Then it's humanized. And that's why every single person that's out there today that is listening to this podcast, you are the change that we need in this world. Not just Anthony Alvarado, not just the sober guy, not just a collective few that are out there advocating, you know, the way that we are. Every single person in America needs to unite and needs to ban arms together, rise together, if you will, and make the change that people are so desperately clawing and begging for. There are people out there that are dying today. 400 plus people today will die from the disease of addiction. We have like one in 10 getting in the treatment. We have a world that we live in that we're starting to discriminate different people for different reasons. And we're starting to see this divide to some extent. And now more than ever, from the momentum, from any social cause, including the recovery movement, we have to fight. 
We have to get back in that arena. We have to share our lived experience, tell our stories on a localized level, influence policymakers, talk at our church, talk at our support groups, influence our local schools to bring in prevention, to talk about furthering treatment so any anytime somebody needs help, they can ask for it and they can receive it. As a parent, I am deeply afraid that my children will go through the same things yeah. that I have been through. That's and scary. the day that they ask for help, man, mm -hmm. Today, if they ask for help today, it's very likely that they wouldn't receive it, and that is not okay with me. And it shouldn't be okay with anybody that's out there that's listening. So this when, is when, this when, is when we talk. Know, no, I, I love it, man, and, and it's it's so yeah. on point. And man, hearing you say, you know, the numbers, and obviously, obviously, the passion, man. That's one thing I love about you, and I loved right from the first moment that we started uh, speaking. A few weeks back is is the passion and I'm sure that everybody out there listening can feel that and I hope it's really hitting home with you and 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 making you um, start to get those wheels spinning and thinking about just like Anthony said it's not just about Anthony it's not just about Shane Raymer that that sober guy or we all rise together like this is a collective issue as everybody and as individuals it's time, you know, that we stand up and it's okay to speak out about it. It is okay to talk about. And I love that you're really hitting that home because it's huge. And when we talk about resources, let's transition into this real quick and then we'll wrap this up. Um, all right, cool. We, we all rise together, uh, rise, and, rise and Grind Recovery po uh, uh, Radio, Rise and Grind Recovery Radio, excuse me. Um, Talk, talk a little bit about what, what you guys are doing over there. I know you have a, a great team of people working together. Um, you guys all have your own individual stories, but you're also out in the community. You're in your local community. You're in your, your cities that surround it, and you're also in the, the, the whole state um, of Wisconsin, right? I mean, you're kind of yeah. all over the place. And so tell us a little bit about that and, uh, and, and, and let us know how we can get more information to get involved. Yeah, then thank you for that. I really appreciate that. I, you know, I took uh, took my lived experience and my story of recovery. Uh, I started speaking out, and, and over the last three years, like you mentioned, we've traveled the country, uh, mostly in the state of Wisconsin. And our goal um, as a grassroots uh, organization is to create a movement of young people by encouraging students to stand up and speak out on the issues that they care about. So really breaking the silence around suicide, bullying, mental illness, and drugs and alcohol. In their community, we can engage them, we can educate them, and we can empower them to become resilient, yeah. amazing, awesome, youthful leaders from fifth grade all the way up through college. So we do that through a variety of different um, engagements, community engagements to help spread awareness that's really ultimately helping to eliminate the stigma around addiction and mental illness and really hitting on home on these other things to help students build life skills. And we do that through educational seminars. We do that through student-led programs. We actually just kicked off this really cool new um, student-led program with our new partners over at Weight21. That's weight21.org. They also have crave21.org, which is a 21-day student challenge that students can give up um, one of their biggest cravings. Hmm. So we can really start teaching students about addiction by branding it through the word cravings. That's so awesome. maybe they, can, yeah, man, like they maybe give up uh, for 21 days uh, donuts or coffee yeah. or maybe their cell phone and then they start learning about like triggers and they start learning about like how to build resiliency and look at holistic approaches to recovery and well-being and really like being clean and sober and making a statement that I'm going to wait until I'm 21 to use alcohol and then on top yeah. of that like stick away from drugs and alcohol all, all together and take this pledge of like sobriety at such a young age and become that resilient leader that peer leader that's influencing their friends and their family and that's how you address culture, man. So yeah. through ties together, that advocacy, that education awareness is really a preventative program that's helping to spread like this motivational workshop mentality beyond the stage, though. That's awesome, and we're man. Doing that that's in a variety of ways. Like I love, love, love what we're doing. Um, it's just so cool that communities are supporting us. I mean, could you ever imagine? Like just, just for reference, like <laughs> when somebody when we started coming up with this idea, like. It was, it was almost like a, I was gonna. La we we're gonna laugh about it. I mean, let's be honest. Like, you want me and this team, and it was our idea, yeah. but like we're saying it to ourselves, like to speak in schools. 
<laughs> about drugs and alcohol. Are you kidding me? Do you remember what that was like back in high yeah. school? <laughs> uh, probably never. Nope, not never. Not ever going to do that. I mean, I'm already have self esteem issues, and high schoolers are rough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. you know, at the same time, we're not going in there and telling them what to do or just say no. I mean, sometimes it is okay just to say no, but we're going in there and saying, "Look, this is what's happening in our community," and I'm I'm able to create an interactive situation with those students and start building a relationship with a large group, small group, doesn't matter what it is, but I'm I'm able to get them to literally stand up in front of me. And I can tell you, Shane, like over the last three years, yes, we've traveled 100,000 miles, been on stage 400 times, but the moments that stick with me is that I've watched 75,000 plus students stand up and speak out and say, my community has a problem with drugs mm -hmm. and alcohol. I've watched 75,000 plus students stand up and say, my school has a problem with drugs and alcohol and something needs to change. I've watched thousands and thousands of students stand up and say, you know, I, I know somebody or I am somebody that's struggled with um, stress and anxiety and I know somebody that's struggling in my family that's been impacted by addiction. Yeah. And I've had students even reach and put their hand up in there and say, today is the day that I'm thinking about killing myself. Like today is the day that it's all going to end and we're able to intervene at that moment, it helps save that student's life. So Amazing. that's what it's about. It's not about being on these, you know, on the news or the media or on the front page of a magazine or whatever the case may be. Like, yes, we've done some really cool awareness things like that, but it's those moments with those students afterwards where they're reaching out for the very first time at a teenage or a young, at a young point of their life. And that, I know deep down in my heart, if we can just walk into that room and we can help save one life, then it was all worth it, man. Anthony Alvarado, you have found your purpose, my friend. How does that work? <laughs> Indeed, man. Indeed. I mean, because like, uh, no, it's just so cool to hear to hear you talk, man. You're talking about you're talking about digging down in the trenches. I mean, that's what you're talking about about getting out there, and I I really admire you for that, man. And it's uh, it's it's an amazing thing, and um and and you know, real quick, and then we'll wrap this up. But getting back to, um, you know, fi finding that purpose, finding that passion. Um, everyone out there listening, man, y'all have something that is, is deep down within you that, that is, um, that is unique to you. And it's something that you can offer and, and provide the rest of the world. And, uh, when, when you get, when you get your mind straight, let me speak for myself. When I got my mind straight and I'm sure Anthony would back this up too, when you get that mind thought out and you start to really dig into who you are as a person, I promise you, you can find that and, and you can start to offer it up. And it is the most, the most beautiful thing. Um, that I know for me, it's the most beautiful thing that's happening and you can hear it in Anthony's voice as well. Uh, Anthony, where can we find you at? Um, if anyone wants to reach out. Yeah, man, I think the best thing to do is just go to we all rise together dot org again that's we all rise together dot org you can also uh check out or shoot me an email it's we all rise together at gmail dot com otherwise you can find me on social media we're on um twitter we're on instagram uh facebook you know send me a friend request and i connect with people all the time love building connections across the country with people if you have ideas i am not um, yes, maybe um, recently I was just had this awesome opportunity to um, earlier this week, a couple days ago, I was in Washington, D.C. I got invited by a SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, to be part of an expert panel to talk about how mental illness and addiction impacts, impacts college students and youth. As cool as that is, as awesome as it is to be considered as an expert, um, I'm an everyday guy, man. Like, I'm always out there learning. Like, the reason I part started the podcast is because I'm just bringing a lot of really cool, awesome people. And I know, Shane, you're going to be on the show, too. Like, it just Looking to learn. Forward to it. So we can learn from each other. So check out that Rise Together um, uh, website, but also check out Rise and Grind Recovery Radio. Um, and otherwise, social media, man. Just uh, find, find me on there, and uh, we can connect and maybe even uh, learn from each other a little bit. Anthony from We All Rise Together. Thank you, my friend. It's been an honor. All right. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. You guys take it easy. Check out that soberguy.com. You can support us on Patreon. Also, leave us a review on iTunes. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you again. Peace, love, respect. Keep your blood clean.